Welcome to the SAG After Foundations, the business program. I'm Lori Hamill, actor, author, and SAG After member. And today I'll be joined by my co moderator, filmmaker, and SAG Indie New York consultant, Michael Sladek. Now, before we bring our guests on, I want to let you know that the SAG After Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies entirely on donations to provide free emergency assistance and free educational programs to SAG After members. This conversation is made possible thanks to the generosity of our supporters. Now, over the past two years, the foundation has given more than $7 million to more than 7,500 performers. If you are a SAG After member and you need help, please ask. And if you can help, please give. And you can find out more information about that in the description of this video. Thank you for your support. And now here's Michael to introduce today's panel. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Laurie mentioned, my name is Michael Slotik. Um, I am a filmmaker as well as a New York consultant for SAG Indy which is a organization that helps bridge, bridge the gap between uh, low-budget independent filmmakers and SAG-AFTRA. Um, today's panel is the second of three Zoom panels about short filmmaking that we're doing. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing pre-production and production. Next Wednesday, we're going to be focusing on post-production and distribution of short films. Um, and before we get started, uh, just note that you can submit questions for today's panel in Zoom's chat function, and uh, we'll get to them later on in the program. Um, we'll get to as many of them as possible later on in the program. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our filmmakers uh, for today, uh, including Chris Griss, uh, Victoria Rivera, and Raika Zetabchi. Um, all three are very accomplished short film and long filmmakers as well. Uh, and we're very happy to have all of you here today to, uh, to chat with us. Um, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and launch into our first question here. Um, although I just said that this, this panel is really going to focus on production, pre-production and production, our last panel focused on uh, mostly on the development process. Um, and I'm going to ask you to begin with a quick development question before we jump into the other stuff. Um, so I'm curious, uh, for all three of you, what is the, how do you come to the short form uh, uh, world? How do you come to the for, short form project uh, development? Do you, do you see this, see the short form as, as its own kind of art form that you prefer or, or like in its own way? Do you see it as uh, a, a filmmaking necessity in terms of finances? Do you see it as a, just simply a practice for your craft? Do you see it as, as a calling card, all of the above, some of the above, none of the above? Uh, if, feel free to, any of you can take that to, to start us off. I can uh, answer for, for myself. I, I love the short form. Um, I consume a lot of short films. I love watching them. Um, and I think it's a great exercise uh, for myself as a writer, as well as a director, because it just offers another opportunity to be on set, to work with actors, and to be able to do so, um, you know, much faster than a, a feature film can can come together. So um, I think it's great practice. And I, I think it's a great also, you know, some people call it calling cards, but I think it's just a great way to be able to make work and to um, have your your kind of work be put out in the world. So um, I think it can be all of that. Mm -hmm. And I'll add to that as well. Um, I same same thing with me, Victoria, for sure. Like I always think it's a really great way to exercise your skills. Um, another thing I love about the short film format is just the ability to like get things out of your system and try things. Um, you know, it's a lot harder getting financing for a feature, of course, than it is to get for a short film. But, um, you know, for me, it's like I, I kind of got into a filmmaking through um, after film school through first fiction filmmaking and then documentary. And now I'm considering doing an animated short and trying a musical or trying a comedy or trying things that I sort of never um, envisioned for myself just to kind of get my feet wet, get it out of my system. And, um, and the other thing is, you know, I've never made a feature before. Um, I've only made shorts and shorts really put me on the map as a filmmaker. And I do believe that, you know, once I start working in long form, I'm always going to continue to do shorts because um, they just, 
I just think they're awesome. Yeah, I agree with that. I love the short form for me. Um, it's like Victoria was saying too, is, and, and you were saying like, you can get things out of your system. And uh, also you can always find a way to make them in a very like low budget uh, style, you know? Uh, if you have just like, if you can reduce things to like two people in an apartment or outside somewhere, blah, blah, blah. Like it, you can always like get to do them with a small crew and don't really need like that much uh, people around or money. And, and I think it's like a great form to express ourselves and also practice if you want to like, you know, get yourself warm because we're in an industry where you have to keep yourself like, like going to the gym, you know, but sometimes uh, in our industry, no one invites you to go to the gym. So you have to like invent it for yourself. And like short films, I feel like are a great form to do that and approach that and to do with your friends too, like friends and family. So yeah, I love shorts. Great. Thanks. That that was really a wonderful way to open up this conversation. And um, I wanted to ask before we get started into the nuts and bolts of everything, how has being a female filmmaker served you? Well, I, I actually don't know <laughs> my question. It's the only type of filmmaker I know how to be. Sure. Um, uh, no, I, I don't know how it, that particularly has informed my work, but I know it's um, a lot of times in the themes that I'm interested in and in um, the, the characters that I, you know, tend towards and that I write. And um, I think maybe it's just kind of, shaped my perspective in that way. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. It's great. I think a lot of times the question that's been asked is how has being a female filmmaker been difficult? But I wanted to ask, how has it served you? Because obviously here you all are and you're all very accomplished and you are making things happen. And it's so empowering and exciting. And so I, I love what, what you said, Victoria, how that helps you shape because it's it's coming from your experience. It's not something else that, um, you know, having a, a different perspective would not be yours because you are a female filmmaker. Would either um, Chris or Rika like to answer that too? Just how is it for you being a female filmmaker? Yeah, actually, Lori, I really, um, I similar to Victoria, I always struggled, struggle to answer that, the question of, you know, like, how have you struggled as a female filmmaker? And I really love the way that you frame that sort of, because, um, you know, I look at it uh, in a more positive light. I think I'm really grateful right now to still be young and have really entered the industry at a time as a filmmaker where a lot of women are getting more opportunities and are being seen and heard um, for the perspective that they bring to the table. Um, so I'm really grateful for that. And I, and I always think about, you know, all the women that kind of came before us and sort of paved the way and had to really face the challenge of getting a seat at the table. Um, but I'm excited. And as you can see, like all of the projects that I've done thus far, um, A Woman's Place, uh, Long Line of Ladies, my latest film, um, Period End of Sentence, which is solely centered on menstruation. Um, they're all sort of females, you know, centered themes. And um, I, I don't know that it's intentional. I think it's just when you kind of approach storytelling from this lens, uh, it kind of pours out of you. And uh, thankfully, people are a lot more receptive to stories, uh, you know, about women. And there's a lot more interest now, I think, than ever before. That's so great. Chris? Um, I think uh, Rika said it really well. Um, and I, I don't know if there's anything to add to that, honestly, I think she said it really well. And, and also like Victoria said, like, it's the only way I know how to do films. Uh, and, uh, I guess most of my characters too are, are women. Um, so yeah, I'm writing a feature right now and my main character is a guy and it's the first time I'm, do I'm doing that. So let's see how that goes. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I think you'll figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, all right, let's get into some nuts and bolts here. So when, once you guys are, uh, so who writes your budgets and schedules and do you find that the, your budgets and schedules are falling into certain parameters for you? 
Um, I think in shorts for me, uh, I do it with my producer, uh, depending on the, on the story. And, uh, if, if we, and, and on our timeline too, if we want to go really fast, um, if we are like, you know what, we'll make this with like $1,000, uh, like we don't care. We'll just make it however we can. Then we try to make everything fit into that. But we have, if we have the luxury of time, uh, then we'll try maybe to raise the the right amount of money that we need, you know? Um, and I always, uh, in shorts, again, do it with my producer. I don't know if I were doing like a larger scale movie, you know, if I would be really involved in like budgeting and stuff because I know it, things are m more complicated uh, if the project gets bigger. Uh, but as of now, I do, I'm very involved in like how the, the budget is being used and for what because for me the priority is always like this story and of course that the crew is like being well fed and all of that so um so yeah i'm very involved in shorts same for myself i think i've always um like he said earlier made sure that any short that i embark on is something that feels you know that it's doable and that it's going to be low budget and it isn't going to be a, a huge drain on on resources um, so, uh, just, I always think about my location as in a more strategic way, maybe at, even from writing process. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm kind of thinking about budget, maybe unfortunately, but from the beginning, because shorts have usually been funded by myself or by small generous grants that I've received from independent organizations. But for the most part, it's something that's self-funded. Um, and so, budget is in my mind from the moment I'm writing. Um, and I work very closely with uh, my producer because like most things in the independent level, you're, you know, you're a little bit of a producer as well as a director and a writer and all this, the good stuff. So um, yeah. I think for me, it, it, um, it depends on the project, of course. Um, you know, sometimes when I um, start to think of a concept for a short and work on the script, if I know right off the bat that this is something that's going to be a passion project that I'm going to have to fund myself or go find some money for, I'm going to think, you know, I'm going to be smart about how I'm writing it. You know, I'm going to keep it more contained. I'm going to be thinking about resources that I can, that I already have that I can pull from. Um, so you kind of put your producer hat on and um, that's something that I do on all my projects. I've been director, producer, even as I transition into features, I'm going to continue to be producer as well, just because I like being close to the money. I like knowing how the money is spent. Um, and I like being uh, being able to sort of make those higher level decisions. Now, when I, or I've worked on projects that have had a thousand dollar budget uh, all the way up to $500,000 budget. And, and still a short film. Um, but, you know, that that was a brand funded project. Um, so that's another thing that I think we're kind of living in an interesting time right now to tap into for filmmakers is like there are a lot of brands out there that um, are funding films and not just branded content or commercials, but like actual entertainment. Um, and so, of course, when, you know, there's a $500,000 budget short that I'm making, I like to take a backseat and, uh, and <laughs> just be the director there and let other people, you know, produce and do their job because I don't have to. <laughs> so um, talking about uh, budgets and attracting people into your team, can you... Um, Talk a little bit about how you've incentivized that for people, whether it's, is it that you work with the same people all the time um, and also reaching out to maybe actors that are more visible, getting them involved in projects? If, how, how have you considered that? So I guess what um, because what we're doing is we're helping actors to start seeing how this could be possible for them to put something together. Um, so any tips you have about how you bring that crew and um, your wonderful actors to your project? Um, well, I would say that uh, like you always wanna work with people you trust. So in my case, I always look, um, I always bring my friends to my projects, um, and because uh, because shorts, you're you're 
especially if you're gonna direct this, uh, you're putting everything into it, like all your energy, all your creativity. You're putting your own money. It's it's uh, you're putting everything on the line for this project. So you want to work with people that you can trust. And I would say if that's a maybe it's not the most creative person, or maybe it's not like the the ideal person, but I mean, it will be the ideal person if it's someone that you can trust. So um, that's how I like to roll in my shorts and in all my projects. Um, and uh, I guess, yeah, I, I always, I, I tend to work with, and then you marry these people, you know, and you're like working, working with them constantly. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that's my, how I do it. I agree with that. And I think the other thing I would add when you're um, when I've tried to bring on, for example, actors that I want to work with who don't know me, um, you know, or even just key crew members and and partners that I want to bring on to the project. I've really found that the the thing that's the most important is um, having a script that somebody can really connect to and that an actor is going to find, you know, really exciting to play or a production designer is going to be excited to kind of build a world around this. And so to me, I really do think a lot of times it comes down to is the script there and then how excited are you and how committed and passionate are you about your project? Because nobody's going to be more excited. No one's going to work harder. And I think that really comes through in these initial meetings when you're trying to bring um, key collaborators on because nobody's coming on to a short for the pay. <laughs> um, for the most people, you know, they're coming on because they believe in you, they believe in the script and the project, and they think uh, that, you know, they have something that to bring to it too that is going to elevate it. So um, I think that the material and your excitement and commitment to the project is really important. And I'll just add, you know, there's been a little bit of talk about like working with people that you love. And um, I think like I've been really fortunate to have sort of formed this community um, around me throughout the years. Um, I went to USC film school and the people that I still work with today um, are people I met on the first day at orientation. Um, my partner, who is like my life partner and also key collaborator, we met first day at, at film school. And it's basically just like you gravitate towards those people. And I think, Chris, you said it great. You marry those people and you you really only want to marry the people that you love because, um, you know, they're they're for me personally, like I think the the journey and the process is so much more important um, than the final product, because I know that I'm a sensitive person. I'm an empath. I know that if I work on a set or have a crew or team, uh, to together and the passion isn't all there, or, um, you know, the dynamic isn't working between people and personalities are clashing. I don't want to spend time managing energies. Cause I think that's a lot of what you have to do as a director. You want to make sure that the energy is feeling good so that you can all focus on elevating the script. Um, and, and that to me is more important than anything, because when I deal with a bad situation on the next project, I find myself being less confident, more fearful, more hesitant, um, to, you know, get into another, a new marriage with someone else. So I think that community over the years, um, just making sure you have those like strong relationships is really important and just continuing to work with those people that you click with, um, cause that's really what makes it lovely. Um, cause filmmaking can be hard. And as far as talent goes, I love working with non-actors and I love working with trained actors. Um, it's really just for me, like comes down to um, finding the person that really like as a person feels like they fit the character, you know, and, and they might not have any experience. A lot of times I've worked with non-actors. I've only cast um, because they were like perfect for the part. They were the person, you know, they were like, they embodied the character in the best way. Um, and not because they read the sides great. Um, so, you know, I think that's always exciting to an actor talent on the other side, when you go, you're the right fit. 
um, not just because you read the lines great, but because you innately understand what this character's journey is, what they're going through. Um, and I find that it turns into more of a collaboration between me and, and the actor um, and something that they can ultimately feel ownership um, over by the end of the project. That's great. Um, I think you partially asked, answered my next question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because I think we may dig into some other aspects of this, but I'm, I'm curious, um, given the obvious uh, budget and therefore time limits on set, um, how do you three go about kind of finding efficiency uh, without sacrificing story, without sacrificing performance or, uh, or like cinematic quality? Any tips? Um, I guess prep. <laughs> uh, I was thinking of, of, of all the times I've been prepping with my producers and VPs and the actors. If you don't, because when, when you start production, when you're on set, there's like no time to waste. You have to be super prepared. There's always obviously space for improvisation and like doing a thing here or there but you really have to be very clear of your objective. Um, and everybody has to be on the same page. Everybody has to know what they're doing. And I think uh, for me, um, whenever, I mean, there's also times that I've done it just like, oh, guerrilla style, you know, going to the street and like, ta -ta -ta, like trying to do everything. And it, it's fun, but it's super risky. Um, and, uh, but, but yeah, I would say like, if you prep really well your scenes, what you're doing, using uh, practical lights and stuff like that, you can always find find ways to to save uh, time and save money and all of this. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. <laughs> I think for me, um, really knowing what story you're telling. I know it sounds really basic, but um, I've been in a short film I shot in 2018 called Night Swim, took place, for example, at night in a pool and we were hit with a massive electrical storm, which obviously meant we could not film anywhere near the water. <laughs> and we lost, um, you know, from a overnight we were doing, we lost half of it. And so, and I knew I just did not have the money to bring back all of these people. Um, and so we were just literally waiting for the rain to pass. And very quickly it was, you know, put our brains together with my producer, who's a close collaborator and a very like trusted friend who I, who we work with a lot and start thinking, okay, what's really important here? What scenes can we do without? What's the story? And um, we were a little bit kind of forced into um, this, this efficiency mode, which was there and we we were able to to make it through because we had aids on the prep and we knew exactly what was really what the story was really about what the scenes were really about which ones i could probably do without because this and that and um so i think really knowing your material and the story you're telling is is also um really important that's great yeah i want to that's super true i just want to add to that that um um if you have also the, going back to the right people and the tr people you trust, your family, you know, the people you're marrying, your team, those are the ones that are also going to rescue you on set when these kind of things happen. I was, you, you made me remember I was on set once and the main actor, we have shot all the end of the story, like the whole ending. And he was just like, I'm done. I want to leave, blah, blah, blah. Like he was hangover and he just wanted to leave set. And I was like, what? I was dying. The DP was freaking out. I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Because we already shot every, like the whole uh, ending, like at 30%, you know, of the, the, the ending of the film. And then, so we sat down. My producer was like, we cannot keep begging this guy. Like we need to make a choice. What are we doing? So we sat down and I was like, I'm like, I was thinking I'm letting everyone down. Everyone's here. Like, what am I going to do? And they were the ones that were like, no, let's think. They sat me down. We thought, how are we going to solve this? And we literally, because we knew the story and the importance, like what we were saying, we came up with like a solution and a transition. Uh, there, another actor 
it became a tiny different story, but mm -hmm. it became even better. And I think it goes back to knowing what you're saying, having the right people there for you. Um, instead of having quitters on your team, you have to have the people that are going to stick to you no matter what. Um, so anyways, just adding to that, like it's important um, to know your story and have the right people on your team again. I think also like it's a skill that you, that you sort of pick up over time, you know, just the more projects you direct, the more you're in that situation where you're having to like think on your feet and rely on your team to come up with solutions right then and there. Um, the more you're under that pressure, the more that like muscle sort of grows. Um, and you know, I, I, another thing for me that I've realized is like, I, I took, I kind of took a sharp left turn and, working in documentaries when I thought I was going to be working in fiction. Um, and I've noticed now how much that those documentary filmmaking skills have sort of helped inform my, my narrative um, directing skills in that I've learned to let go a lot of that control. Um, you, you know, and that's not to say you shouldn't prep as much as possible, ex you know, know your story, um, like the back of your hand, like I completely agree with everything you guys are saying. I like the, the thing for me that I've discovered is do all that prep, know exactly where you're trying to go with this story. Um, but expect that you're going to show up on the day and you're going to lose all control, you know, to the elements or to, you know, personalities or whatever it is. And you just got to learn to roll with the punches and kind of um, just, you know, know how to pivot and also welcome that, you know, instead of sort of having a fear based approach where, oh, no, everything is crashing and failing. This is not the film that I set out to make thinking about the big picture, stepping back and looking at how, you know, how you can salvage things or how you can creatively pivot in a way that's actually exciting as opposed to daunting. Oh, that's so great. I, I love it. I think everyone needs to hear this, um, not just about filmmaking, but life too, right? All the things, that, all the curveballs that come up. Um, I'm, I'm just um, going to pop in one of the audience questions that have, that's come up. And since we're talking about shorts, uh, how have you found um, your projects that are shorts um, as far as the length, um, I know a lot of times people will say it's whatever the story is, but the fact that we're talking about shorts, can you just um, maybe talk a little bit about how you've decided at a length for your shorts? I can step in here. Um, obviously, it varies from project to project. I've noticed, um, you know, a lot of times shorts, uh, you're trying to get things out of your system, but also you want people to watch the film. You want to have an opportunity to do a festival run with it or um, you know, get it on Vimeo and get a Vimeo staff pick, which Victoria is very familiar with. Um, so, so a lot of times you're also thinking about, um, I think it's in, smart to be thinking um, ahead of the, the project, um, thinking about sort of the strategy, um, the future of the film and where it's going to go. And a lot of times with fiction films, I like to think um, on the shorter end, like something that's maybe under 15 minutes, because I've noticed that um, it's a lot more programmable with film festivals, like they appreciate shorter narrative films. Whereas with documentary, I've noticed they're, they're a little bit longer and sometimes even 30 minutes. Um, so, you know, of course, it, that's not going to be the deciding factor. Film festivals, it's always going to be what's appropriate for the story, how much time you need to properly tell the story the way that you want to and the way that you feel is right. Um, but at the same time, if you're constantly getting this feedback that it feels like it's dragging, you got to not be precious and you got to take a step back and look at how you can trim because it's really only going to benefit your festival run ultimately. I totally agree. I actually had a festival a programmer once explain it to me as if your film is, you know, 20, 25 minutes, 30, you're taking up what could be three great short films. So that, you know, one film has to be better than all three in order to really earn that spot. And, um, you know, if, if, people are, are going to watch a short that's it's in the name. Um, I think keeping it short is, is a, is a really great thing to strive for. Obviously understanding that sometimes 
Um, you know, some stories need a little bit more time and, and they need that, but it is, I think, important to keep in mind that if it, it goes past that 15 minute mark, you are, you're getting into a, a zone where festival programmers or even people online, which ends up being a lot of, you know, where people watch shorts, you lose them just because the format, um, is really fitting for that kind of shorter time period. So how about any, uh, we're going to go to audience questions in a moment, but I have one more. Um, <clears throat> any uh, rookie mistakes that you made along the way that you wish you uh, had ad- advice from someone telling you not to do on the way in? Kids, animals, cars. <laughs> <laughs> Water. What was the last one? Cars? Skateboards. <laughs> Skateboards. <laughs> Sorry, go for it. Kitties. That's my answer. <laughs> No, no, no. I mean, yes, there's a lot of things like that that you want to avoid if you can, unless they're like super necessary for your story. Um, uh, but I guess, uh, I don't know. But I remember I was, I once had someone in my crew that was really just didn't have the right vibe and was making just like a bad vibe talking and talking like spreading you know that juju or energy how you say it and um and you know I didn't know really that I could fire people I've never fired anybody honestly um but in that moment I remember thinking like what do I do with this person and um just know that (laughs) if you have someone on your crew that's making everybody like change the channel because you want to keep the good vibe you'll become a family when you're on set like just know then you can talk to your producers and like try to figure it out you know because it's not fun when you have someone like that that is like just not bringing the best out of the people around them um and yeah i wish somebody told me before that i i could do that (laughs) yeah you could do a whole talk for like the next several hours about um because <laughs> um, there are so many of them and I think still to this day I mean you got to think like you know sometimes I'm like I'm going to be 65 years old and film you know directing a movie is going to feel like the first time um after all of those years but I just like some kind of high level um advice is uh it's good to be ambitious, but don't be ambitious to the point where you're shooting yourself in the foot and you're already jumping on board a sinking ship. Um, and that mm-hmm. kind of starts with your idea and the concept. You're most often as a director of a short film writing your short film. Um, so, you know, if you have a budget in mind, uh, create your concept and your story around the budget. Make sure it's workable because you want to make sure you have more time and more resources available to you as opposed to putting that money and those resources into something that you know feels totally unattainable on a $10,000 budget. Because um, really what's going to end up happening is, is your, your performances are going to suffer. Your, you know, your vision is going to suffer ultimately. So if you have a vision that's too big for the budget you have, maybe put, put a pin in that and come back to it later. Um, and then the other thing is a major rookie mistake that I've made in the past is not thinking about, again, I go back to like stepping back and thinking about the films that you make, shorts even, as products like for yourself you know like ha- like something that you can use to advance your career in some way whether that be putting it through film festivals or you know there's um netflix and hulu like there's streamers that are interested in now acquiring shorts and tons of other streamers and publications that are interested in acquiring shorts um So know your strategy before you release the film. Don't just go release your film online and give up all those opportunities because no one's, uh, you know, no one's going to tell you that you really that's something that you have to learn. Um, And knowing your strategy, knowing that you want to do a, you know, have a robust festival run and ultimately try to sell the film to Netflix or put it on Vimeo and get a staff pick. You know, I think you have to think of those from the get-go because once you release that film out there, you've lost your chance. 
Thank you so much. Great, great stuff. And, you know, of course, like, like you said, um, Rika, is that we're, we're constantly going to be learning as we go through all of this. So it, it was, we so appreciate everyone bringing their experience to this. Um, I want to go to an audience question. And Sean, um, this is uh, from you that you're saying that, you know, a lot, a lot of actors are watching and the training that actors have is not the same as going to film school. So as far as crewing up, um, getting into that network, um, wondering where might you find that? Where, where is, um, I, I noticed that someone on chat said something, you know, about mandy.com, but where, because actors don't go to film school to be making films, but go to film, go, going to acting school to act. Um, could you talk about any places that you think that people could find, um, crew, um, to be able to get those great relationships, even though you didn't come up through, you know, a film school together? I myself am, consider myself a little bit of a credits sleuth. Um, so anytime I, I, I watch something that I, I love or, you know, I, I think a particular uh, part of the craft was done in a really interesting way or an actor that I loved or um, that the sound design was in beautiful. Any, I'm always looking at credits and then spending some time looking that person up. What do they do? What have they done? Um, and honestly, reaching out, um, I've it's it, I've done it. I think with a lot of my projects, um, as composer, looking for composers, um, DPs. I'm I consume a lot of uh, short films and and movies. Um, so I'm also always just looking up uh, different DPs. There's also some sites that I like to. Uh, look at, for example, uh, there's cinematographersxx.com, which is um, specifically for female cinematographers, um, just because I love working with women. And, um, you know, there's there's just tons, but I, I watch a lot of stuff and I look at credits and I look those people up um, and I reach out. And I think that is a, a good way to, you'd be surprised the, the amount of uh, people who are just you know, happily surprised that somebody has noticed their work, their particular work in something and are willing to start a conversation and maybe even, you know, jump on your project when, when you have it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really great advice. Um, I, I totally agree. That's, that's great. Like start a database of like all your favorite talent and um, cold email them if you have to. I, you know, I think a lot of times you just have to adopt that spirit of just being shameless and reaching out to people and just sharing your passion with people. And hopefully they'll, you know, be responsive to that. Um, another great way is there's tons of databases now like that are online that um, like free the work, free the bid, um, you know, like even like uh, female uh, filmmakers. And it's not just like, directors, but it's like editors, composers, writers, um, you can go to these websites and find um, a lot of talent, talent that, you know, sometimes don't get the opportunities that they deserve and would love to partner with you um, on something. And then uh, another really great way is, I think for actors too, is going to film festivals. Um, you know, I've met countless filmmakers who uh, who I love and collaborate with to this day at film festivals because, you know, I had a film in the shorts program and I was sitting through our shorts program and saw their film and their film was awesome. And, you know, like Victoria said, like you see like cinematography that you love or editing that you love in a project. And a lot of times other filmmakers are there and you connect with them. And it's a really great way to be sort of in a in an environment where you're sharing your love and passion for filmmaking um, and getting kind of like FaceTime with people and getting to like establish relationships, not just through email, but but face to face. Yeah, I agree. I agree with all of that. And I think it's great advice. And I've done that where I've reached out to people on email on, or on festivals, you know, talk to the people you like, or even Instagram. I sometimes and I know we all fall on different kind of rabbit holes on Instagram. Um, but I always tend to like, oh, this person that I really like their work, who I, are they following? Who do they like? What what are they doing? Blah, blah, blah. And then um, it's always nice uh, if you reach out to somebody 
to reach out not not only with your project uh, or with admiration, but maybe with like, would you like to grab a coffee and like kind of make friends? Because also that way you're going to know if you actually click because maybe you like somebody's work and it's like just not the person you thought they were, you know? So it's really nice to get to know them first and then see if like it's actually somebody that you would like to collaborate with. Um, and uh, but yeah, that's 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 it. And just one more thing I want to really quickly add two documentaries I've made now started uh, or, or were made possible because of a Facebook message on Messenger. Um, just finding a subject uh, through an article or something, finding them on Facebook, and then just writing them a long heartfelt message on Facebook Messenger and kind of, you know, connecting with them and starting the process of, you know, building trust that way. Um, so two films I have to thank for that. That's great. Good stuff. Um, I have another um, uh, audience question. Uh, forgive me, I don't know who it was from, but um, is, if you can only hire a skeleton crew, what would you say are the most essential roles to bring on uh, and what roles could be eliminated or combined? Uh, how do you guys shrink things down in an effective way that doesn't hurt the project? I think it's obviously very dependent on what the, the script is, but um, I really like to think about trying to uh, film in locations where we can really use natural light to our advantage so that you don't have a have to have a big, you know, lighting team. And it also keeps things really intimate. Um, so I think if if you can afford the luxury of working with natural light, that's always something I will tend to, especially if I want to work with a smaller crew. I to me, the most important people are your sound is is just I cannot you know talk about how important that is and um, your your cinematographer um, who can you know be your your cinematographer can be your camera operator. They can be the ones to handle like a light or two um, if, if you can keep things small enough. Um, and I think having somebody, for example, who's working with you um, as a production designer and just making sure that the details and everything in the scene um, is, is there. To me, those are kind of key positions that I always find myself working with. Um, and... Uh, but yeah, it's it's completely project dependent, um, I think. Yeah, I agree. Uh, if you can find a location that is the location, um, the bedroom or the kitchen that is already has everything, you can save like a lot of money that way too. When you find just a place and like ask for a favor, if they let you film there or whatever. But I agree, those three positions are key for me too but also agree that depends on your story. Um, but yeah, sound. I used to think <laughs> that sound wasn't very important when I started making films. And I think it's a mistake that many people make because uh, you think like, oh, we can get away with it. Oh, we don't have time for the boom to come or whatever it is, you know, sometimes. And it's a huge mistake. Sound is like so, so, so important. And um same as cinematographer and your production designer, wardrobe and makeup and those things. I think you can always like work it out with your actor, especially if someone that is super invested in the role that they're doing um, and is passionate about it, then you don't have to worry about that. Um, but the, the those three roles and your producer, obviously, your producer can be your AD too. Uh, and they can save you from a lot of things. They can even like, bring the food to set like do everything lots of things so i uh, i would also count the producer yeah don't ever skimp on sound cinematography or editing i mean those are the things that make movies movies um you know and uh like i've been fortunate that my partner who's like my main collaborator is a dp and editor um or has been a dp and editor on every project that we've done together and sometimes being a DP and an editor is so involved that we'll co-direct projects together, you know, because he's already so um, ingrained in the process. Um, so I like being able to find um, collaborators that are also like multi-hyphenates, you know, people who um, enjoy wearing a lot of different hats. Like you have a producer who also has the skill of being an AD. 
Um, and uh, yeah, I just think like cinematographer, editor, sound, do not skimp on those, find the best people, people you love and people who you admire and people who challenge you. That's so great. Thank you so much. Um, anyone else, anything else do you want to add about that? Anyone? Okay. Um, this is a question that came through an audience question. When you mentioned brand funded shorts, did you pursue the brand or the pitch? I work in commercials as well. Um, and this was something that happened after um, one of my first documentary projects. Um, but kind of learning about the ad industry and, and learning that um, that brands are, you know, no longer interested in just doing the 30 second spot or the 60 second spot. They're also interested in entertainment and content. Um, so I've had brands come to me. I've also um, you know, had seen, seen briefs from, from brands and, um, tried to pitch my take on projects. I've also heard a lot of stories of filmmakers having a great idea for a brand, um, or a brand film and literally like cold emailing the brand or the brand leads and basically pitching their concept to them and, and that working out. So I think it goes with this idea of like being bullish and, and really just like being aggressive. If you have an idea that you believe in and know, you know, is, is going to be killer, then, then go after it. There are, I mean, just to dovetail on that for a second, even though it's not our focus, um, <laughs> in terms of production, um, there are, I mean, there are companies like REI is now kind of famous for really pursuing making films. Uh, they even have a production company now that does it, you know, uh, but it has to be specific. To the, the subject of your film has to be kind of work within their world of camping and outdoors, uh, outdoors men personship. Um, do you, uh, another uh, audience question um, do you guys allow improv improvisations or are you sticklers for kind of sticking to the script, uh, especially given the constraints of time and, and money? Um, I'm a super improviser, even though I said like plan, plan, plan. Uh, but because that will give you uh, the, you know, the flexibility to improvise when you're on set within the plan, you know, um, I'm always improvising with uh not only with the actors but with my dp i like also i i'm really like a director of actors i feel like i really focus on the actors and instead of the i know we all directors have different uh focuses some really focus on camera um but i i really like to be with them and like get the story with them and out of them. And uh, I feel like with improvisation, you get really nice surprises. Um, and sometimes not, you know, but it's always, it, it, it's always like fun to do them. So I'm a big pro improv um, within the space. Yeah. And even in locations too, like if we're walking outside, moving from a location to another, I would be like, oh, can we like steal something from here? Or like if we have time, you know, I, I tend to do those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, is this enough, uh, unless anyone would like to add to that at all? Okay. No, I, I think I have a very similar process to Chris. Okay. Um, another audience question um, as about getting money to make your shorts. Um, could you talk a little bit about other ways to get funding outside of your own bank account and family? Good question. I don't want to borrow from family. <laughs> Sorry, Victoria, you answer. <laughs> no, I, I all I was going to say is um, I found um, there's a website called No Film School and they put out a really wonderful list. I don't know when, uh, but constantly um, that is uh, that has short film grants. And I go through each and every one and I see if my project is applicable. And sometimes it isn't, sometimes it is, but they put out a really great list. There are short film grants out there. Um, it's, it, you know, it's, they're not huge, but you can, if you have one application and you put together that work and, you know, really put it into one, you can usually use that application and do small modifications for the others. 
So um, it's just one big chunk of work in getting, and that process is actually really helpful of why do you want to make this short? What are you trying to say? You know, those kind of questions um, and then being able to use that for different grants. So um, I would definitely check out No Film School and see uh, what their 2022 uh, list of short short grants are. Um, I personally have never done crowdfunding. I don't oppose to it whatsoever. And I support a lot of friends and, and other projects who even people I don't know. So, and I know pe some people have had great success. Um, I've just never wanted to do that approach um, and all, have always tried to uh, piece it together by grants and self-funding. I've actually never had luck with grants before. I've applied to grants in the past, but um, but I think the the thing for me with grants is I, it, it's amazing that there's so many resources out there, especially for shorts. Um, they do take more time. Um, so you need to like have your pitch together. You need to have your materials kind of lined up. You need to submit. And then there's a process usually of waiting to hear, you know, if you got the money or not. And a lot of times my projects have been more dependent on, you know, someone's schedule or, um, uh, or, you know, a location or whatever. Um, so I like for me, crowdfunding <laughs> has been um, <clears throat> like just a lifesaver. I mean, my first documentary ever um, that ended up winning an Academy Award was fully financed through Kickstarter. Um, we had a $60,000 budget and we did two different Kickstarter campaigns. And at that time, it was like the only way I knew how to how to raise money for a film because I had just graduated from film school and I had done two other Kickstarter campaigns before and they made my other films possible. Um, and I think the great thing about crowdfunding is before you even set out to make your film, there is a community of people sort of rallying behind you to get this film made. They know about your project. And a lot of times that brings more resources to your project than just money. A lot of times people hear about your project um, beforehand because of the crowdfunding campaign and want to help you in other ways. Um, and I always think that's really valuable. I also was wondering, um, this was something that came up actually in our previous panel, but someone had asked um, whether or not, as a filmmaker, you recommend with the shorts, uh, creating an LLC. Does, has anyone done that or decided that might be a good uh, a path to take? I've never created an LLC for a short, um, just uh, uh, for a feature but not for a short, but I don't know, maybe I missed on something and it's a really good idea. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I can answer this real quickly, but an LLC is usually when you have investors, um, more than one investor, so that it's a, a kind of a group uh, organization that protects everybody uh, financially and legally. So I don't know how many short films necessarily need to do that unless you've got a bunch of investors that are coming on board short. Great. So I think we're going to need to wrap up. Um, but uh, one of the questions that came in that I um, is just so lovely here was about finding out if there are any other, this is from John. Do you recommend any books or websites? Thank you for the resources that you've given us, all, all three of you. Really appreciate it today. Um, but if you recommend any books or websites or resources um, to help give you the knowledge to create your, your projects um, or something that you think might be good for our audience of actors. No film school. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we've had a lot of resources that there was already inspired. some mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all good. Anything that inspi inspires you, I just think is very particular to the person. Um, sometimes I can go into YouTube and like just start typing and watch uh, an interview from like Micaela Cohen and be like, all right, she read like write, writing, uh, you know, that book for dummies. I, I forget like. <laughs> that one and she just read that and she wrote like a whole uh tv show out of that or stuff like that and uh i think it's really you can find inspiration depending on what you like or what you but it's really poetic to you um but yeah 
I think it's very personal. Mm-hmm. And panels too. Panels like this panels, are mm-hmm. always a really great way to like get current information. And you can find a lot of these panels um, also at film festivals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I also just love reading a lot of scripts that I can usually find online or again, reaching out to the filmmaker, but um, I love reading scripts and I've, I've found it helpful for my own writing screenwriting as well. Good points. Um, and as far as panels go, that can lead us straight out of this and into our little bit of an exit um, before we let everybody go though. I just want to remind everyone that we'll be doing another zoom next week, different filmmakers, uh, really focusing on uh, post-production and the distribution process, film festivals, et cetera. So um, tune in next Wednesday. And on behalf of the SAG Foundation, SAG After Foundation, um, thank you guys. Thank you to all three of you for, for uh, joining us today. It was a really wonderful discussion. And for everyone in the audience who chimed in and uh, was here to make this possible, um so thanks for sharing and good luck for everyone and take care keep up the good work